who you all know, who you all heard of, heard from. He's gonna, he and I are gonna be doing this uh, together. Um, uh, before we get into it, can I ask a question? Has anybody in here heard Neil and I have this conversation before? Do uh, have? Um, the beautiful thing about this conversation, we have had this conversation before, but the beautiful thing about it is, I have no idea how it's going to go. Neil and I do not really get together and chat about it, decide what we're going to say. We just kind of listen to each other, we chat, and uh, well, yeah, exactly. And so feel free to take, uh, give your input. This is literally a conversation, but it's not a private conversation. This is Neil and I having a conversation with you, and if you have some can you pitch in the conversation? Please feel free. Uh, if you don't, I will probably come and give you a mic when I make a stand up here. Um, anyway, uh, you all know Neil. He's a he's a attorney and a planner. He's a very smart guy. I am the state uh, property rights ombudsman. I am also an attorney. I'm not a planner nor am I a very smart guy, but that's okay. Um, uh, it was asked that I before I get we get too much into the list here that I explain exactly what an ombudsman is. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, exactly. It's some kind of Swedish word. I don't know what it's supposed to mean. Typically an ombudsman is somebody who's part of an organization who helps solve problems with the organization. So for example, you'll have an ombudsman at a university that will help when there's complaints at the university, okay? I'm the state property rights ombudsman. My job is to help resolve disputes between citizens and government over their land. Okay, so say for example, uh, there's a dispute over eminent domain because you got or some city or something needs to put in a road. The property doesn't like it. I sit and I try to resolve that. Land use disputes, all these kinds of things that you've heard about today. Um, I have a statutory mandate to, to keep up on that kind of stuff. And I step in and I try to resolve these disputes so that you don't have to go to court. Okay? What this really means is that all the crazy people in your town, and you know who they are, think for a second, who's that guy that comes to planning commission meeting every time? You know who he is? He calls me all the time. It's free. Right? So I have to talk to that guy and you don't have to talk to him as much as I do because most of the time I get him to calm down, hopefully. Um, and uh, so you all owe me lunch. <laughs> so anyway, I am okay. Sorry, I got Thank you. Um, so that's what I'm buzzing in. So any other questions or anything about what I do, uh, it'll probably become more clear as we go, but, but feel free to ask. What we're here to do today is we're going to talk about just a list of things that I put together off the top of my head. I uh, call the 10 things the Ombudsman's Office wants you to know. A uh, big part of my day is answering phone calls and stuff like that, talking to people. And after you've answered you know, your 50th or 100th phone call in the week about certain subjects, you start to see trends, you start to see things form. And uh, you know, sometimes I really wish that I could tell people exactly what I'm seeing, what's happening out there in the world. And so uh, we put together this list and, and we have this conversation about some of these things, I hope we kind of enlightened about some of the things I'm seeing. This list was different a year ago, and it will be different a year from now. Uh, this is kind of what it is now. Um, again, those of you who have heard us have this conversation, I don't know how it's going to go. It might be similar to what you've heard before. It might be pretty different, but in any event, we are going to go for it, and we're going to start talking about some of these things. Absolutely. Maybe you could tell us uh, about the jurisdictional limits of your office and whether there's questions that you get that people think you can answer, but you can't answer because it's not part of your job. That's a great, that's a great question. Everybody there? You all okay? Um, talking about the jurisdictional limits of my office, because it does have, I do have jurisdictional limits. Um, just like with any government job, I can only do what I'm told that I can do. Um, what happens most often, let me, let me ask you this question. If you think you have a really good grip on the difference between the legislative and administrative decision, raise your hand. If you think you have a moderate grip, if you've heard the word legislative before, <laughs> there are a few more. Okay. Um, 
As planners, especially as staff and as planners, especially, if I were to say there's one subject that you need to become an expert on, that's you can. It's the difference between legislative and administrative decisions. And I travel around the state um, uh, preaching and teaching and trying to help people understand that. And it's important, the distinction is important to answer Neil's question, okay? Because legislative decisions, decisions that the, the, the county commission makes or whatever, the decision to change the law, we talked about it here today, like zoning and so forth, I don't have any jurisdiction over those subjects. Um, people do call me all the time and they say, uh, you know, I applied for a zone change and they would give it to me, or what's the deal with the zone over there? And, you know, I can sort of explain a lot to them, but I don't have any jurisdiction. Uh, but for most administrative decisions, most decisions that are made sort of applying the law, uh, those are the kind of things that I can help with. And one of the main things that I do to help with those kind of decisions in the land use context is I do advisory opinions. Raise your hand if you've ever had experience with an advisory opinion from my office. I know there's a few frank you guys. Um, the purpose of an advisory opinion is someone brings a dispute to me over land, over administrative land use decision, and I take a look at both sides of the decision, and I try to answer it where I'm predicting what the court would say. So that if it went to court, you would know how it would result. I can't say that you know that is a 100% foolproof system, but the idea is to try to settle the case. The idea is to try to get everybody, you know, a 30,000 foot view of the dispute, so that you can talk about it and hopefully work it out. And that almost always works. It's actually very. Uh, we have a very good track record. 150 or so advisory opinions, and I know of like three that are on litigation. We know it's working because you just look at the appellate case ledger, it's a lot shorter. Yeah, I mean, for good or bad, right? <laughs> I mean, we would all love to know more details about the law, what the courts have to say, but in order to do that, somebody has to go through a lawsuit. <laughs> Here I am out there trying to stop lawsuits, so I'm ruining it for y'all. <laughs> so, does that answer your question? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, so, if you have any kind of disputes, Call me. If you have, if you have uh, people who are, who are causing problems, tell them to call me. I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. Anything else before we go on? Anything else before we go on? No. All right. Let's start with Liz. The planner's role in the land use process. Now, um, when I say planner here, I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about both citizen planners and professional planners, the staff and the Planning Commission members. Um, what is their role in the land use process? Okay. How many of you think that the, planning, the planner's role in the land use process is to um, make sure that there's always plenty of uh, disputes and lawsuits? <laughs> um, that's um, it's interesting because a couple of comments. Um, I find that the planners, the, both the professional planning staff and the, the citizen planners, I find in almost every case that they could have been the vehicle to stop a dispute before the dispute gets too bad. They could have been. And too often they miss the opportunity um, for various reasons. And I'll, I'll tell you a little story and then we'll see what Neil has to comment on that. This happened to me today, this day. Um, a guy came into my office, just dropped in, didn't have an appointment, came into my office and sat down with me and he said, look, okay, I have uh, applied for subdivision in my um, county, and uh, if this sounds familiar to any of you, you know, let me know if I did anything wrong. I've applied for subdivision in my county, and I, tonight I'm going to the fourth planning commission meeting where the subdivision approval has been on the agenda. Not one time have they said that in any respect, my application does not comply with uh, every rule. Okay? But what's happening is, for the fourth straight meeting, there's been a huge crowd of citizens show up, and they're basically doing a filibuster. And so the citizens, they start open the public comment period, and the citizens start talking, and they go so many nights. And, for, and this, they've done it that three times, and they're doing the fourth one now, and he expects, by all means, he expects the same thing to happen. He's, he's getting ready to sue um, for approval. The four uh, commissioners and everything, the four uh, staff, 
Uh, you know, this is a pretty small town where this is happening. They don't know what to do. The whole town is out there complaining about this thing. Um, what could they have done? Yeah. What could the city have done? Or the, the county, what could the county have done? Well, I think one thing the county could do is change the rules so that public hearings are not required for administrative approvals because we create expectations in the mind of the public that what they say will make a difference and legally must make a difference. Uh, and, you know, I have a kind of I'm ambivalent about, about that in the public hearings. The state and the judiciary setting. Right. The public setting. I mean, the rule is, I understand it, that if I, mean, that if I meet the code requirements, I'm tied to the approval. But if there's a question about whether I meet a particular standard, something someone testifies about in the public hearing may help inform whether that standard has been met or not. Right. So I think it's very helpful for the government to say, if there's a public hearing, say, we're going to have a public hearing. Here's the standards that apply to a subdivision. Tell everybody in the audience that's going forward. You can remind the commissioners, these are the standards. If the standards are met, ladies and gentlemen, we have no ability to deny this application because the rules in the case make it very clear. We can't deny it if, if, if uh, they meet the standards. So when you come to the podium, ladies and gentlemen, please bear that in mind. And, oh, by the way, here are the standards. We even provide a list that people can pick up this, at the door based on their agenda. Right. Standards for conditional use approvals, standards for uh, subdivision approvals. Maybe you have a specific standard under your conditional uses for job counts. Make it available to the public, maybe even in advance of the meeting with your meeting materials, so people can be informed about what's the nature of the discussion that ought to be occurring. So the idea is when you get there, they'll have something so that they'll know what decision is being made and what standards are being used to make that decision. So that they're going to speak, they can say something relevant that applies right there. And if they don't have anything relevant to say, well, I mean, I don't know if that's going to stop them speaking. Especially here. If they're trying to fill a Rex Lee, you all remember Rex Lee, constitutional law professor at BYU and very well known constitutional lawyer, used to say in our law in our in our law class, there's nothing worse than an undelivered speech. And that is really true. When people come to the government and they want to have their opportunity to say their piece, but it is legal to say you're you're only entitled to two minutes because we got a room full of people and we want to give two minutes to everyone. Right. So you can do that, and the chairman can say, uh, sir or madam, we've heard testimony on that point again. Uh, I think we understand it. Would you move on to your next point? You can do that. So you need a, a chair who's ready to do the meeting. So it's right. your feeling that you have to give them a chance to talk? I mean, if we, we talked before about not having public hearings during administrative decisions like that. I've kind of backed up on that opinion a little bit, but it's your opinion that you kind of have to let them talk. No, no you do not, unless your code says so. In fact, I believe there's a bill pending it right now before the legislature that would remove the public hearing requirement from subdivision approval. I guess, no, that's a city ordinance I'm thinking of, not yeah, that's yeah. Right. It's already been changed. Yeah. But, so if your ordinance says you have to have a public hearing, then fine. But I would say, why do you have that in your ordinance? Maybe in a more quiet time, it's passed, the ordinance you can evaluate whether that's necessary. Well, let's get back to this question up here. The plan is on the land use process. As I said, I've seen a lot of cases where I think that the dispute could have been headed off the pass by planning staff. Um, if they maybe been more careful about how to handle, you know, if they applied the law more carefully, or if they'd been more careful about how to handle public plan, or what do you think about that? I think that that's a good observation. Uh, <laughs> I have, uh, you know, I have a little saying, I think this applies to your, to your situation, and it, it, it applies to many. I, I think when we are local government officials or planners, we can either be taxi drivers or we can be traffic cops. Okay. We can throw up roadblocks uh, and make them stop at every place. Or we, you know, we know the process best, and we can say, "Well, I, you can. Here's how you can get from point A to point B. You can go around these traffic jams and get here, and this is the most efficient way to do it." 
I think that's fair to do, to tell the public how your process that's works. That's a taxi driver? That's a taxi driver, you know, and he gets you to the airport uh, when all the traffic's on the freeway, he knows the other way to get you there on time. So, planners, I think, I'm just speaking, this is my opinion, sure. I think sometimes may be afraid to do that because the people at the top level haven't really said what they want the planner's function to be. So they sit back and they're careful and very proper and don't say anything that might be misconstrued. And so very, very formal. They don't feel empowered to really manage the situation. How many of you are, are on planning commissions? A lot. How many of you have been on planning commission for less than a year? Just a few. So most of you have been on for a while. Okay. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like uh, your role is not clear? Anybody? Everyone knows exactly what they're doing? Obviously, it's a big city. I'm from a big city. When you live in a small town where everybody is related in some way, uh -huh. yeah. and you get a land use dispute, uh -huh. who are you going to let win? <laughs> Uncle Joe, doesn't Mike? <laughs> Which is why, and then I go back to my comments earlier when I had the presentation, if you have a defined process, which I hope is written down in your code about what your process is, at least minimally, the, then you have a rule book so it doesn't become a completely subjective, oh, I like Joe and I don't like Tom, I'm going to vote for him, because that's the worst of all worlds, is to just have it be totally subjective. And yes, you've got to make some tough decisions. If you accept the role of being a planning commissioner, guess what? You're basically kind of a judge, and you've got to judge fairly. You know, that's, to me, that's easy to say. I know hard to do in a small town. Well, I have an advantage. I'm an outsider. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so no one has to listen to you, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of goes to something, a point I wanted to make about what scares your lawyer. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to say um, variance hearings, and people have decided the variance because it's, you know, ran the various because it's Cousin Joe, you know, or because this is the old lady who used to babysit me. I actually talked to somebody who said that. Oh, yeah, she used to babysit me. I love her very much. But, and you got to live with these folks, you know, you got to, you see them at church, you know. Um, the, the thing is, what scares your lawyer is, is losing a lawsuit, okay? You, you might get sued, right, by any number of people. You know, if you say no to the guy, he might sue you. If you say yes to the guy, the neighbor might sue you. Um, any number of things might happen, okay? Typically, your lawyer's not so much afraid of getting sued, he's afraid of losing. And what's going to cause you to lose the lawsuit is if you haven't followed the law, okay? So if the, the law is in place to, to help guide how the decision should go and protect everybody's property rights. Okay? But if you haven't followed the law, you've made the decision based on the fact that that person, you know, is smelly or whatever. Um, you're going to lose that lawsuit, you know, if it happens. Hopefully it doesn't, but, you know, eventually it gets around. I mean, that's all I all day long. Can I comment on that? Absolutely. You know, if, if you make a procedural error, you can re-notice the hearing and have a do-over and that will probably fix the problem. But if you don't fix a procedural problem and they sue, you'll probably be sure to lose. Because the courts are very, very protective with the due process or procedural rights. They're built into the code, state code, or your local ordinances. If it's a matter of judgment about what's substantial evidence and what's not substantial evidence, if you make a good faith effort to put evidence on the record, I think the government probably going to win that lawsuit, right? Yeah, I mean, almost in almost every case, if you follow the law and you've done what you're supposed to do, the government almost always wins those things, as long as you follow the law. But your attorney doesn't want to lose. It's interesting if you talk about the procedural part, too. Um, the same guy who talked to me today told me that the first, the entire first meeting where everyone was filibustering was uh, everybody complaining about the notice. And they let people get up and say, I didn't have notice. I didn't have notice. But you're here. But you're here. <laughs> right? 
And, and finally, at the end, they said, well, we'll send out, we'll, we'll be sending out the notice. And all the neighbors just went nuts, you know? But they did, they be sent out the notice, came back to the next meeting, and it just started with something else. So why couldn't the uh, applicant pull the so-called ripcord in this situation, could he? Uh, I don't know any reason why not. You want to sort of talk about what that is? Okay, and you fill in the gaps, Brent. So the, the ripcord rule, it comes out of state law, and it basically says that an applicant is entitled to get a decision from the approving entity, the, the decision-making authority, within a reasonable amount of time. And if, if they feel like they're getting jerked around, there is a procedure in the statute that says they can request that a decision be rendered. And I think it's 45 days that has to be rendered within that time. I don't recall that there's any penalty provision for not doing that. Um, no, there's really not. But, uh, uh, except for except for if there's no response, it's considered to be a no. Right. If they don't ever say anything in, in the 45 days, then they said no. And there's no deemed approval rule, right? Meaning that if the 45 days passed and the government didn't react, some states would have what's called deemed approval. The failure to approve or take action is deemed an approval of the statute. <clears throat> the development community has raised that issue from time to time in our land use group meetings with the, between the government and the developers, they would love to have deemed approved language in the state law so that if things don't move fast enough, their project is deemed approved. And so that's another reason why we need to follow the law is so that if we get a deemed approved clause in the statute, um, that will make life difficult in some situations, I think. Good point. Um, and I don't know any reason why the guy can't pull the court provision. In fact, I did talk to him about that. Um, I think he, he's trying to see how long it takes to work through that process so the neighbors don't come try to burn down when he's going to build. But you never know. Uh, any more comments about the room? We just had a 10 to bounce around when we did this something. Okay. Um, let's move on to number two. Okay. Uh, a trend that I'm seeing uh, development restarts. Okay. Over the last year, what I've seen a lot of, and all of the next three or four are related, is um, back in 2006, 2007, as you know, around development was just going nuts. Okay? If you're planning this after, you know back then you were way busier than you are now. Even in smaller towns like Palmas, that's true. Um, development, you know, people were coming and getting applications and filing them, and people were getting approvals left and right, and a lot of headbutting, but things were rolling forward, and then everything just fell off the cliff in 2007, and it ended, right? And nothing happened, and a lot of these developers, they went completely out of business, right? Um, uh, you know, they, banks took over the developments and stuff like that, and so there's been several years where it's been quiet and solid. So what's happening now is things are better, right? And people are coming back, and they're wanting to do these developments, okay? So they're walking into the city, and they're saying, well, uh, county or city, five years ago, you gave me approval for this, and now I want to do it. Now I want to actually do it. Well, five years ago, you had different ordinances, you had a different council, um, and to make matters worse, and this goes to the next point, for five years, instead of being a big building next door to all these people's houses, there was grass. And people like grass. And under your scenario, Brent, the zoning hasn't changed? The well, the plan hasn't changed? Some, sometimes maybe yes, sometimes maybe no. But a plan's been approved, but it hasn't been built yet. Sometimes maybe yes, sometimes maybe no. Sometimes it's, it's they, all they did, like in 2007, the day before it crashed, they filed a, a preliminary approval. Uh, well, what makes a difference to whether they can go forward or not? That's a great question. Well, um, it, you know, I mean, there's always the best thing question, okay? If someone applies and makes application under Utah law, if someone makes application for development approval, they best, at, as of the time their application is complete, right? Which means that they get to go forward with their development, okay? Um, under the ordinances that are in place at the time, okay? Well, what if they filed that and it's five years later, or six years later, or ten years later, right? And in the meantime, other things have happened in town, circumstances have changed. 
They still get the bill done. Can I comment on that? Please. You know, what you just explained about vesting, I think, is the popular understanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an expansive view of the word vesting. And I believe that the more narrow definition applies. You're vested in whatever the approval of the application would give you, not more. So if you are applying for a preliminary subdivision approval, you're vested as to the preliminary and have the right to apply for final. But it doesn't mean you're vested for final, and it doesn't mean you're vested for a <clears throat> And I hope everybody's code says that when you get a preliminary approval or you get this approval, if you need to move forward with reasonable diligence. That's what the statute says. And you can even put a time frame in there that says, if you don't apply for final within one year, your vested right will expire. It doesn't last forever. But if your code doesn't say anything, then it's going to be a rule of reason, and then probably the applicant's going to be in a more powerful position of arguing his case. Neil said something key there. How many of you know if you have a ordinance that puts a time limitation on development? Good. If you don't have one, put one in there. Seriously. You know? Uh, for each application type. Yeah, for each application. For preliminary, for, for, for uh, final approval, for uh, building permit, put one in there. Otherwise, you're going to be like this situation I know of in Park City where these folks have invested for 25 years in this development that they want to do on the side of the mountain, uh, which no one wants, and um, lots of things have changed there, new ski resorts have been built, stuff like that, uh, which makes their development just not good, at least popular opinion, I'm not expressing opinion on it, but they're vested. Down. Well, I, you know, I couldn't tell you that. Okay. I know that the city will tell you that, yeah, I mean, we can't, they, they tell the people all the time, yeah, we can't do anything about this. Here's a, here's a really important question to ask about vesting. So let's assume the guy comes in on a site plan approval, and it's a multi-phased project. Let's say it's 10 acres or, I don't know, 25 acres. It's right. size of it. Right. And they move forward with phase one right now, and they build it. And it's platted, you know, the, the property is divided, and we have one lot that's built on, and we have another <coughs> lot that's still vacant, and we have another lot that's vacant, but we have a site plan that's approved for the whole thing. And the vested right rule say, it says hypothetically, if you don't take out a building permit within one year after site plan approval, you're not vested anymore. So what's the deal with the other two lots? Can you just say, no, sorry, you can't build anything on those lots? That's a great question. I don't think so. You know, because if you say he's not vested and he's got a loss, which he's already been platted, you have to allow some reasonable use of be facing the takings claim. <coughs> so again, you have to ask, what's the unit of analysis? Am I vested in and 100 acres that's never been subdivided? Or am I vested in 101 acre lots? Of course, you know, this is only one of the scenarios we're talking about. There could be any number of other kinds of situations, like, for example, this case that I know of where they have full approval, subdivision is all done and everything, for a subdivision where the road comes out here, and then they stop. In the meantime, the road on the other side of the street is built up there. I know lots of those. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't want an intersection like that. So back to these guys who are fully vested and everything is done, trying to require them to move that street, which is going to cause them to lose multiple lots. You know, because they sat there for too long and there was no expiration or anything. So the higher one came later? Yeah. But the higher one is there. That's the point. The higher one is actually built. This was approved, not built. You know, and I don't know all your facts, but I think maybe the government's going to be buying a little road improvement. I think they are. This kind of thing is presenting any a of problems. These developer restarts. I don't know. Is any of you seeing those in your area? Good. Lucky. Are <laughs> <laughs> they you see these in your area? Neighbors. Yeah. Um, it used to be when I first took this job over, it used to be that I got a ton of calls from developers, and the developers would just cuss out the, the county, you know, and say all sorts of horrible things. I'm just not seeing that anymore. As a matter of fact, it seems like everyone pretty much is on the same page. 
We know the city or the county, they, they want some growth, reasonably speeded growth. Things are going at a reasonable speed right now, so the developer and the county want the same thing, but the neighbors are going nuts right now. That's what I'm seeing. This neighbor's going crazy. Um, a recent case that I had to deal with was one where there was a five phase commercial development going on, and they built the first four phases before everything. And this developer, you know, wanted to come back and build the fifth phase, but, you know, there was just no way it was going to happen. So the developer put in beautiful field, about an acre or two acres of grass. And it's all right next to this residential area, okay? Well, those people in that residential area sure love that grass. And so things got better, and the developer said, okay, I'm ready to build phase five. And my phone started to ring. And I got invited to what I call a pitchfork meeting. <laughs> uh, that's where you know, everyone has pitchforks and torches and they're ready to go burn down City Hall. And I went in there, and there was there were more than 100 people in there. They were the neighbors, all the neighbors, living next to this beautiful field of grass. And they were among them tell us what we can do. And they actually said this. They said, we heard that the ombudsman always decides in favor of the property owner. <laughs> and, um, yeah, exactly, the property owner's rights ombudsman. Yeah, exactly, property owner's rights ombudsman. And when they said that to me, like, six things went through my head. It's like, okay, which property owner? Because you guys are property owners, but this guy is the developer's a property owner, and really the city's a property owner. Right? Um, and second, second of all, but what if the property owner is wrong? You know. um, but anyway, the point is that uh, they ended up, they asked for an opinion from me, and I issued it, and the property owners, the neighbors, ended up suing anyway. The developer and the city were in perfect harmony, they were happy as can be, and the neighbors ended up suing anyway, and it went all the way to trial, and they lost. Um, so the developer did have a best of right. Oh, the developer had a vested right. It was actually, um, I'll tell you this. Um, you may or may not know this, but when you get an advisory opinion from my office, uh, there's an attorney's fees provision. Okay? So if I make a decision and it does go to court, and the court hears it and decides the same decision that I made, it, basically the court says the ombudsman was right, right? The court can award attorney's fees to the party that challenges the, the opinion. Okay? In this case, when we did the advisory opinion on this subject, the neighbors didn't participate. They intentionally didn't participate. They didn't want in the litigation. They didn't participate in the advisory opinion. They didn't participate with my office. They had me come to the pitchfork meeting and stuff like that, but when I basically told them what was going to happen, you know, they decided, well, we're going to take our chances. And so uh, I, did the, I did the opinion, and it was a no-brainer, okay? And so, the, but the neighbors went ahead and sued anyway, okay? And when it got to the court decision, the court basically said, this is a no-brainer, okay? You know, the neighbors, you lose. And the court awarded attorney's fees, the developers' attorney's fees against the neighbors, based on our opinion. The neighbors didn't participate in my opinion. They knew about it, they did not participate, yet the court still awarded attorney's fees to the developer. And the neighbors challenged that? Uh, they, when that happened, so they had to appeal that decision that they had to pay? No, but what happened is as soon as that decision happened, the neighbors and the developer and the city all got together and they used the attorney's fees as a negotiating tool. So they said, look, let it go and we won't make you pay the attorney's fees. And what the neighbors going to do? How much was it? Do you remember? No. No. But it was significant, you know. There was there was five figures in a crooked number. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, this is the kind of thing I'm seeing uh, right now. Um, you know, just like the story I told about the, the, the guy today. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll tell you also, and I don't mean to think of all the time. Sorry, Neil. But um, I'm just the core company. Yesterday, I had this guy come in today to tell me about this this uh, you know this filibuster that's going on. Yesterday, I got a call from one of the neighbors in the same case. That happened to me all the time, by the way. In case you're wondering. Um, 
one side will call me and, and ask for my help, and the other side will call me and ask for my help, and I get help to whoever asks for it. Neighbors call me in the, same, in the same case, asking me for advice on how to stop this development. <clears throat> so, uh, I had to explain to them a little bit about zoning, and I had to explain to them a little bit about how they don't have a right to zone, because what, what their strategy was going to be is it was going to be, when we bought here, we didn't know, no one ever told us that that was an industrial zone next door. That was going to be their strategy. And so I had to explain a few things about that. Constructive notice. Constructive notice, and the fact that, you know, even if you bought and it was an agricultural zone, they could have changed it to industrial at any time. You know, so that's not going to work. No. Anyway. That's what I'm seeing a lot of the problems with neighbors. Do you have any comments on that? Any further comments on that? No, I mean, my only comment is to reiterate what I said before. Make sure your ordinances reflect your process in detail. And if you want an example of what I'm talking about, you can go look at the Centerville City Code. I wrote that several years ago for them. Uh, or Honeyville, I did one for them. They're both similar. But it has all the procedures in one section of the code. It lists every kind of permit, every kind of application. It says who, who, who gets to apply. Sometimes we have fights over who gets to apply. Yeah. What kind of paper you have to submit with the application. Who reviews the application. Who makes the decision. What, what vested rights flow from that decision. What you <coughs> right to do next. And how long it lasts. And the appeal process. And you kind of put that all together a little section for every every uh, permit. So there's no there's, there's a lot fewer fights about the process. If you if you know the process, you don't have to fight about it. It's just written down. Then the fight comes to the more substantial evidence and other yeah. kinds of questions where if the government's done a reasonable <coughs> job, you're probably going to prevail. But if we're arguing about process, that shows we probably have a weakness in our process. I mean, we're, we're on the we're on the shorter end of the stick now. Doesn't that underscore too some of the things we've already been on? Um, the idea that the planners have a role here, and you know, and planning is part of that, and making sure that their ordinances are up to date, and making sure they got the processes in place, because that comes back to this situation. Because if the processes are in place and it's all up to date, you know, if the neighbors who are the ones who are organized now, who are the ones who are fighting, who are the ones who are suing now, the neighbors sue, your lawyer will win. What you want? I know that's what Bart Cruz wants. He wants to win for you. So can we go to this one? I think. I think. Absolutely. Let's do that. I think the development agreement question ties into the scenario we've been talking about. Uh -huh. Let's just extend it a little bit and let's assume that there had been a development agreement with, with this scenario that you described. But I'm going to change the facts now a little bit and just say let's assume we had a development agreement, but no activity occurred. Okay. What's the situation? Is he entitled to move forward? Is that development agreement last forever? What, what if the government wants to change its mind? I've had people ask me that question. You know, I'm new <coughs> in the council, and the old guys did this agreement. We don't want it anymore. Uh, and, you know, and they this project has died anyway. So can we just ignore that? Well, that's a great question. I mean, what's the purpose of the development agreement? Tell me. Well, it's to fix the rights and obligations of both the government and the developer. To get everything locked in so you know exactly the procedure, the process, the rights and obligations, everything locked in. And, and it can be a lot in the agreement, or it could just be a little, depending on what they want to really talk about. Okay. Some agreements go way overboard, I think, and they specify a lot of detail, so much detail that they don't anticipate that things can change. Right. And then one side is locked into their detriment, and they start fighting and things go sideways. Well, you know, when we talk about this right here, development agreements lately seem to have kind of thrown a wrench in the works. Okay, in a couple of places that I'm aware of, and I know you are. Okay? For example, like you said, where, hey, we had a development agreement ages ago, okay, and everything stopped. Now where everything's restarting, and what do we do? So your agreement should say what happens if things stop. Yeah. You know, there's a rule in tort law that every dog gets one free bite. <laughs> you, know, person you don't know he's a bad dog until he bites you. And the same thing is true with a development agreement or a zoning code or whatever. You don't know you have a bad agreement or a bad code until you have a mistake. Yeah. And so our job as planners is to be far-sighted and foresighted enough 
to be able to see potential problems that we address it in the agreement. Like what happens if development stops? So hopefully we won't go into that at all. Well, one of the interesting things about being a lawyer is that you don't always, you, you're, it's impossible to anticipate every possible problem that will happen. We're great at looking backwards, though, and saying, hey, what happens if development stops? I mean, back in 2007, who thought development was going to stop? Right. Um, but I know of the case, uh, and this kind of goes to this one a little bit, but the case in Saratoga Springs, the big case that caused that referendum to happen, that was, there was a development agreement. There was multiple development agreements with multiple addendums. And uh, one of the attorneys, according to the local newspaper, has filed a lawsuit to, to preserve his applicant's rights under the agreement. That's exactly right. And that's what's happened is there was an agreement to settle that out. The guy's just trying to the guy's just trying to develop, restart his development, at least in his mind, I can't say this is true, but we started his development in line with the agreement. And what happened? Bang. But let's go back to this for a second, okay? Tell me when the development agreement is appropriate and not appropriate. I mean, you wouldn't want one for every development, everybody that comes to your door, right? I think that's probably overkill, and we need to distinguish, and the next session is going to talk about performance agreements. I think there's a difference between the performance guarantee or the performance agreement and the development agreement. It's probably a matter of scope. But some people think of development agreements as belt and suspenders. It's the suspenders and the ordinance is the belt. Right. Uh, and if you can do X under the ordinance, there's a good argument to be made. You don't need a development agreement because if the developer fails to comply with the ordinance rules, you always have your regulatory authority right. under the statute or your ordinance to enforce your code. So typically a development agreement would be used when you are getting something or you want to get something that the code will not provide. That you're not otherwise already entitled to. Right. Right. So not belt and suspenders, but you know something unique. Uh, so I would use it in those cases, and I'm specific about why we're using it. And I have to put this plug in before I forget. If you do development agreements, make sure they say no money damages are possible. We've, this is the hindsight rule that we've learned in a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of recent cases. Language would say, if the government knew that it would have to pay damages because of the failure of uh, the government to do something, it would have never entered into this agreement. No damages. What, what we want is specific performance. That's the legal term. We want people to live up to the terms of the agreement. That is the remedy, not money. And uh, how many millions is the... Uh the latest uh, jury verdict for the... About 20 million. Yeah, it's, uh, and they're still fighting, so we don't know the answer to that. Yeah, case. we don't know the answer we, to that. The law court is found against the local government. This is the Tooele City, you know, the Tooele County case. Yeah, city. 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 city, right? It's city. Yes, city. 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 Anyway. Um, well, let me kind of follow up, and this may seem elementary as well, okay? When do you think the development agreement is absolutely crucial? I mean, when would you not? You've already said that the development agreement is appropriate when you're talking about, you know, agreeing to something that you're not already entitled to, okay? But if someone comes to the county for one of these folks and wants a development, how are they supposed to know, you know what, we need to call Neil. We need to call somebody with experience in development agreements and have them help us get one together. Um, when, when does that trigger? Well, that's a very good question, Brent. Uh, you know, I, w I use development agreements primarily in a rezoning situation. The developer comes in, naturally they go to the lowest zone property because it's cheap, okay. with the idea that they want to upzone and put a big project on. So they come to the come to the county planning commission and they and the county commission they put on a dog and pony show and say we're going to have a wonderful project. <coughs> oh, by the way, there's not enough water out here yet. We're going to have to have the county help us build the water line, and, and we need a few other utilities extended for who knows how far to the property. But I'm the developer, and I'm willing to front end it uh, if you'll pay me back. Yeah. And so, okay, in that situation, we do an agreement to make sure that if the developer front ends it, he gets paid back, and we specify, well, what happens if he doesn't do all these wonderful things that he's proposed to do that are outside of our code? You know, he's 
hanging on all kinds of ornaments on the Christmas tree, trying to entice us to rezone it. And, you know, I've seen several times the situations where that happens without an agreement. The zoning is granted. <coughs> the developer flips the property, he's out of there. The next guy comes in under, under the zoning that you put in place and says, I want to do X. And you think, oh my gosh, that's not what we planned. X is bad. We didn't want, we would have never zoned it for X. But you zoned it, dude. I know. Yeah. And that's when I use an agreement. Okay. That, and good. I make sure it runs with the land, so it's not, not personal to the individual, it runs with the land. You say that in the agreement. That's good. That's good. Okay. Anything else about the development agreement? No, we we'll probably going to move on. I know, we're running out of time. If, if, if you guys want to talk about EDs specifically, speak up. Okay. Uh, let's see. What do you want to talk about next? Yeah. Yeah. What did they say? Yeah. 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 You guys, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> How often? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I know you know who these people are. You know who Jerk, Idiot, and George Weirdo is. <laughs> I know. You're already thinking of that person in your mind. And so what happens is, is George Weirdo calls me. And after 45 minutes on the phone, I can finally figure out that he speaks English and figure out what his problem is, okay? And I call the county or the city, and I say, I just got a call from George. <laughs> How was that? <laughs> well, it was great. Um, but he has a problem. Yeah, I know. He has his problem. Well, you know. The law says this, what do you want to do? I don't want to help that guy. That guy's nuts. That guy's a jerk. When he came up to the to the counter, he yelled at my people. You know, or he's constantly putting up big signs, you know, completely unrelated to what he wants, but he's putting up big signs or he's always causing problems. Okay? Well, that's a that's a, especially in a small town, isn't it? That's a hard thing to, to get past. Okay? Well, they all still have property rights. And they have the same property rights as everybody else. You know, and that's just a message that I try to get out to people. Is these folks, they are entitled to have their rights protected. They're entitled to have you make the decision on the same basis you make the decision with everybody else. They're entitled to, when they put in an application, they're entitled to have that application uh, look through, through the entire process, no matter how big a jerk they are. So, you know, that's, it happens all the time. And I agree, they're idiots, okay? But it happens. You have any comments about that? No, you covered it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what that. Go ahead, fire it up. The problem that I frequently see are conditions of approval that go beyond the scope of your authority. Such as? And, well, okay, so a guy wants to build a house, it's already a subdivided lot, it's on a regular street, but we don't have any curb gutter or sidewalk. We have sidewalk on this side of the property, and we have curb gutter and sidewalk on that side of the property. And oh, by the way, the street is two lanes here, but just a few hundred feet or maybe a hundred feet down the road, it's four lanes. Yeah. And we want to finish that four lane segment because this little bottleneck is really creating a problem. So a guy comes in to take, he wants a permit for a house or a duplex. And we say, sure, you can put in that house as long as you build that four-lane segment. Is that fair? No, that's an unlawful exaction. So you can, here's the basic rule. You can make the developer bear the burden necessary to satisfy problems that he causes or his project causes. But when you ask him to satisfy problems that are citywide problems, that are not created by him or his project, you've gone too far. So, but we seem to, we seem to forget that. There, there's been very few things that have been quite as consistent as long as I've had that job, uh, this job, as far as these actions go. I had these action calls the first day that I started. I had these action calls yesterday. It, it just, it, it never so seems to end. Just, uh, can you give us the flavor? What, what's the typical scenario? Is what I described or something different? Well, you know, it's interesting because at the first time I had this job, a lot of places seem to have this policy that um, if you uh, apply for something, 
We're going to put an automatic condition on you that you put a curb gutter and sidewalk in front of your house. You know what I've experienced is something similar. People say, hey, we have this guy that wants something. We want something. Let's use this as an opportunity to get that thing. Well, and that's exactly the point. I mean, people, they want curb gutter and sidewalk, but the city can't or the county can't afford to pay for that. So you come in for uh, some kind of permit. Okay. You can build your curb, curb gutter and sidewalk if you want if you want your permit. Now, but are you saying that you can't require curb gutter and sidewalk for the next little lot? No, what I'm saying is, though, that what you ask for has to relate to the impact that they're creating. Okay, so if my, if my code says we're going to, every, every lot that gets a building permit has to provide strip paving and, and strip curb gutter and sidewalk, is that okay? No? No. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because, because I might be applying for something that is not going to create any kind of burden on the city. It's not going to increase, definitely not going to increase the need for a curb gutter and sidewalk. What if I'm building a house? If you're building a house, well, then you probably can require that, okay? Because what you're doing is you're adding one house's worth of impact. One house's worth of impact is an impact, right? And so, curb gutter and sidewalk in front of your house, under most circumstances, there may be exceptions, probably reasonable. But what if all I'm doing is remodeling my basement? You know? Or what if all I'm doing is putting up a gazebo? No? Curb gutter and sidewalk? I need that curb gutter. I know. You really want it bad, but can't have it. Sure. Well, I don't want to tell you that, uh, I guess using your term, exacts 30% of the developer's land for open space. Well? In other words, he loses a third of what he owns because the county wants to look at grass. And the county does that every single time that someone comes to develop because their neighbor's lost that down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not going to do that. <laughs> so I haven't been there long enough to know that. Sorry to debate that. Sorry to debate that a little bit. Anytime, any exaction, and, and um, Bart talked about the Coons case, and, and, and I read the Coons case even a little bit more extensively than Bart did. I think what the court said is they said, look, you anything you ask for, if it's a condition of development approval, you've got to meet the exaction rule. Yeah, let, and let's go over the exaction rule for a second, okay? And that this is a burden that the government has. This is not the applicant's burden. The government has to show that the exaction is roughly proportional and it, it, it's reasonably related to the project and it's roughly proportional to the problem caused by the project. And the government has to demonstrate that relationship not in, not in any exact way, but in a reasonable way. I mean, it's not a mathematic, mathematically exact way. Although, what the Utah courts have done is they've, they've taken the term roughly proportional, and they've changed to say roughly equivalent in terms of dollars. And so, you reduce each side's cost to dollars, and are they, are they pretty close, or are they big, is there a big difference? And if you're asking the applicant to pay more dollars, and then the other side, you probably have a problem. What I like, how I like to look at it is the problem and solution thing that the court said, okay? If the development is causing a problem, you can exact the solution. The solution has to solve the problem the development causes, okay? So in your particular case, asking them for 30% dedication or 30% land for open space, okay? They can't do that unless that 30% land of open space is going to solve the problem that the development is causing. And can I give you a hypothetical? Yeah. So let's say the government has adopted a rule that says every lot, every development from now on has to give 30% because we decided that legislatively that's the standard in our community. And it's not. We're not asking anybody to do anything different. Everybody has to do the same thing. Giant stamp. Bam! Unconstitutional. Okay. And the reason why is because the court has said that it has, it's got to be looked at as a case-by-case -case basis. You've got to determine what the impacts are. Then you've got to determine whether or not what's being exacted is a solution to that impact. And then you've got to determine whether or not it's roughly equivalent in cost. So along those lines, in some of our metro cases, we have the PUDs in our mountain zones. So we basically try to cluster those that development effectively doing the same thing, saying we want you all, you may have 20 acres, but we want all the houses here. Nothing can be built here. Is that an exaction? I don't think so. 
No, I mean, I, I, I agree. agree. We need to give you a couple more facts. Let's say it's one <coughs> large parcel, not subdivided. So you say, our rules are you can, you can develop here, when you get X density, and you need to put all your density in this smaller spot and leave the rest untouched. I think as long as it's reasonable development, that's defensible. Let's say it was 10 They've already told us that, why can't I put houses on that other spot? Well, and that's the, that's the flaw in, in the theory, that you need to put it in a conservation easement that someone's going to step up to enforce. But oftentimes in the future, the open space gets subdivided because a new, a new political body decides why not. If they're, if they're entitled to, to, to one house per acre, and they get one house per acre, even if it's clustered, <coughs> um, I think there's a good argument that it's not an exaction. But even if it is an exaction, I think there's a good argument that you're solving the problem. No, we the use problem. Water, we use watershed protection as our justification. So, I mean, we're actually clear in our ordinance the reason we do that is specific to watershed. Well, if, if the development is causing a watershed problem, you can exact certain a proportionate amount to solve that problem, as long as what you exact solves the problem. Okay? The problem, the problem isn't, in my mind, you know, one house per acre all clustered and all this open. The problem is when you say you're entitled to one house per acre, but we have a watershed problem, so you're only entitled to one house every two acres. That's when you have a problem. The thing that complicates this, let's assume your hypothetical was ten parcels, and eight of the parcels are going to have houses on them, and two of them are big parcels. They're already subdivided and have been for years. And now you're going to tell the guy he can't build on that parcel. That might, that might be a taking. Yeah. Because each parcel has its right to, to reasonable <coughs> use. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's the Love Ladies Harbor case, I think, from Florida. But it relates back to what, what we were saying before about development agreements, too. I would never ask anybody to cluster uh, without having a development agreement with us. I would not do a cluster and subdivision as a, as a by right thing. I'd make them ask for a rezone. Because rezones are legislative and, and entitled to, to reasonable debatability as a standard of review. Right. And substantial evidence. So, what's that to do? Rezone. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And if the, if the neighbors aren't happy with it, you're a developer, you do have the referendum potential. That is correct. The referendum problem is, of course, the people going around asking for a referendum, or asking for signatures, and they're saying, do you want all those horrible poor people living there? <laughs> no. It's like, no. I mean, a question like that would naturally not be the issue. They get their signatures, it gets voted on on that basis. That's why I love that legislation. It's, it's kind of this year that uh, inform that where the government gets to inform people of the implications of what they're doing. Because this kind of thing can lead to a taking so easy. We can yeah. Yeah, so easy. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Fine. And we will we will be seeing those cases, I'm sure. Okay. For a while. Um, our time is up. Anybody we can steal a little bit of time if anybody has one last thing you want to talk about. Anybody want to talk about impact these? No, please no. Number five. And Kevin. Number five. Conditional uses. Conditional uses. Um, please get training on conditional uses. And once you've had training on conditional uses, please get training again on conditional uses. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, if I were, to, if I were to, to say that there's one portion of the land use law that in my mind is least understood, even with good intentions, no one's trying to... People are trying to follow along. People are trying to do their best. They just don't understand the principle of conditional uses. Okay? So tell us. Um, people think that conditional uses are a chance to look at something and say, no, I don't want that. I don't want that here. Or maybe I do, maybe I don't. And that's not what the point of conditional uses are. Okay? If you put something in your code and said it's a conditional use, what you said is, I want that here. I want it here. In this way. I want it in this zone. You said yes to it already, okay? But what you said is, but I recognize that there's some detrimental impacts. So I'm gonna, I can impose some conditions to mitigate those detrimental impacts, okay? And those conditions that I'm imposing are related to standards in the ordinance. You mean like a dog kennel in the middle of a neighborhood that's going to be because it's convenient? Or yeah. You hear the noise from the dog? Yeah. And so you want to impose, the noise from the dogs is a detrimental effect. We can all agree on that. 
And we have a state of our ordinance that says that in our residential areas, we want a level of noise, you know, a quiet level of noise, okay? So we have a standard, we have a use that we want, but it's got a detrimental effect. So we're gonna impose a condition, say, you're gonna have to put up a high wall or something, or you're gonna have to put insulate the panels or something to keep the noise. And you can't tell me I can't have a panel going. No, you can't, you get your panel, because I put it down as a conditional use. You get to have the panel. What if they cannot mitigate the, the detrimental effect? The statute says that if you cannot, it's not if they cannot mitigate. It's, a, it's you cannot, you as the county cannot impose conditions that mitigate it. It has to be impossible for you to impose conditions that mitigate it. And that's a practically impossible standard. Yeah, that if there's any not set of conditions that will mitigate the, ha the harm, it must be approved. If they can't, if you do impose conditions and they can't meet them, you know, that's not a problem unless your conditions are unreasonable, unless your conditions are not supported by substantial evidence on the record. I have seen people who have tried, said, we really don't want this here, but we understand it's conditional use, so we have to do this. Let's impose a condition that they can never meet. No. We need to say one other Thank thing. You. The basis for the conditions has to be related to standards you've written down in your code book. That's right. They can't be standards that you made up out of thin air the night of the approval. If, you're, if your code book says nothing about noise, you cannot afford the condition of noise. You have to have that standard in there. What's the time frame? I mean, Legitimately or legally, the time frame for conditions to be met or, or not met as far as approving that. Condition. On a state law basis, there isn't one. I would say it's there's a rule in the state law that says they have to comply with, use reasonable diligence to comply. Yeah. But I think it's entirely appropriate to put a standard in your code and say you need to comply within a year or six months. Uh, and if they don't, then your permit lapses. That, that's reasonable. Yeah, or you need to comply before we'll actually issue the permit for a building. Yeah, that's what we do. I mean, as long as you're, as long as you're related to, to the standards of your ordinance, as long as they're reasonable, as long as they're not exactions, because I've seen conditions be imposed that are legal exactions, as long as that's the case, you can impose them, okay? But you got to understand that you have to say yes. The problem with conditions, oftentimes, is our codes are not specific enough. They say, uh, we need to protect the health, safety, and welfare, and that's about as far as it goes. But it would be better to say, let's say we have a gravel pit. You must have a dust control plan. You must do hard asphalt. You must do this. And there are specific kinds of things that are, that are identified in advance that you can apply the conditions to. Um, I'm going to plug something really quickly before we end. Okay. Especially on this condition uses, okay? My services are free, and my obligation is not only to help the property owners who call me, but to help you. It's in the statute that I'm supposed to help you, okay? I am delighted to come to your town, your county, okay? April 1st. April 1st, my downtown. <laughs> and I will spend, I will spend as much time as you need just talking about conditional uses or any of these other things or anything. But I can spend three hours just on conditional uses to try to help make help that make sense. I'm happy to do that. I will do it anytime. Call me and I will come. Uh, I have a visit with some of you folks and I hope you think you've been successful, but conditional uses in particular, I know you guys want to do them right. So let's make sure that your people understand what they are. Anything else? Yeah. Put your information. My mom there, is it? I'm talking about UtahPropertyRights.com or dot com, Property, right? PropertyRights.Utah.com is what it is. And I'll tell you my phone right now if you want to hear. What is it? Well, if you haven't visited that website, there's a ton of excellent material there about all these subjects. They can be used as training materials for your staff and your planning commission. Uh, I mean, there's a wealth of wonderful information there. Thank you. That's kind. Um, and that's the whole point. My point is to help you. My point is to keep you out of court. I'm trying to trying to keep you from getting sued, or if you do get sued, I'm trying to help you win. Uh, all these things that I see every day, uh, you know, uh, I'll do whatever I can to help you with them. If some of you have experience with that, I hope you feel that way. Five three zero six three nine one. Anything else? Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.